So after talking about you know God's foreknowledge, after talking about God's predestination, after talking about the call of God upon a child of God's life, after talking about the justification, after talking about the glorification, after talking about all of these things, Paul comes to Romans chapter 8, verse 31. He says, what then shall we say in response to this? What then shall we say in response to this? In response to what? In response to God's plan for a child of God. Amen. So you'll have to understand the sequence of it. He says, look, everything that goes wrong in a child of God's life, every suffering, every setback, every struggle that a child of God goes through, God uses all those opportunities for the good of a child of God. Because he uses all those opportunities to reform our character, to refine our nature, and to make us like his son, Jesus Christ. And God is taking us to a point of glorification, eternal glorification. So that's where God wants to take us. Amen. And God has blessed the church or the child of God with the Holy Spirit, who is helping the believer through his journey on this earth in every way. The Holy Spirit helps the believer to pray. The Holy Spirit gives that assurance of the, of, the, of the glorification that is going to happen in the future. The Holy Spirit confirms that, that you know, this person is a child of God. The Holy Spirit helps a person to, to put to death the deeds of the flesh. So, so much work is happening in a child of God's life through the, through the, through the Holy Spirit. And every, everything that is going wrong, God is using all of that to shape and to, and to form a Christ-like character in a believer's life. And he's taking us to a point of glorification. So after talking all of these things, Paul comes to verse 31. He says, what then shall we say in response to this? And the next couple of verses, there are four questions that he's asking. There are four questions that he's asking, and he gives responses to those four questions, which tells the security that you and I we enjoy as believers in Christ. Okay? Let's read verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? First question. The first question that he's asking what shall we say in response to all that we have discussed earlier? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's a question that he's asking. If God is for us, if God is for us, who can be against us? And what is the answer he gives? He gives the answer in the next verse. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If he has given his own son for us, how much more he will give graciously all the things that we need to live a godly life on this earth and to complete the race that God has marked out for us. Amen. Are you with me this evening time? Hallelujah. Right? So what is it that he is willing to graciously give you and me? God is graciously willing to release forgiveness for you and for me. Freely, God is willing to give you and me forgiveness. 
if he has given his own son, how much more is he willing to forgive you and me after we have become his children? Are you with me? Hallelujah. So what does it mean? You see, we need to, the whole of Romans, when we study from Romans chapter 1 to 8, can you understand the depth of God's word to redeem you and me? The effort and the depth of God's love and the work that God has done to save each one of us. Listen to me very carefully. He left his heavenly glory. He left all the position that he had in heaven. Came down. Took the form of a human being. Became a servant. Lived his life on the earth. Went through struggles and insults and sufferings. Went on the cross. Gave his life for us. He, he, was, he, he died. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. He went into heavens to prepare a mansion for you and for me. And he has sent the Holy Spirit who is there as a help for you and for me. And he's constantly interceding on your behalf and my behalf. Look at the depth of love and the work that God has done for you and for me. To redeem you and me. To save you and me. Now I want you to understand this. After having done so much, will God forsake you and me? Ever. It is not to reject you and me that God you know, went through the pain of saving one soul. I want you to understand the parable of the sheep. That one sheep that was lost, the shepherd went behind it. He was not willing to lose that sheep. You and me, after having come to know Jesus Christ as a personal savior, when we fall frequently, when we fall repeatedly, God's plan is not to reject you and me and to throw you and me away. But God is constantly working night and day to embrace you and me, to redeem you and me, to bring you and me back into his presence. Amen. If he has given his own son, how much more will he graciously give us all things so that he can take you and me from the starting point to the end point, which is the point of glorification. Amen. He will not leave you and me halfway. I want you to understand this. This is the security of salvation that a believer has in Jesus Christ. God wants to take us to the end point. And God is committed for that. Amen. So if God is for us, who can be against us? I want you to understand this. You know, the devil and his angels doesn't want a single person to be saved. They do everything possible for people not to be saved. After they are saved, the devil and his angels are working overnight to pull you and me down. Amen. Because they want you and me to keep falling and keep falling from the grace of God. And they want you and me to walk in guilt and shame. And eventually, they want us to move away from our faith. That is the, that is the work of the enemy. But I want you to know this evening, time. but if God is for us, no forces of darkness. No devil and his angels can stand against you. If God has given his own son to redeem you and me, how much more grace, how much more forgiveness God will release and graciously give us all that we need so that you and I 
you know, we are secure and you're able to continue to run this race and finish the race that God has given to you. Amen. Amen. So question number one, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? What is the answer? He says, the answer is simple. If he has given his own son for us, how much more will he not give us graciously all things that you and I need? With me? Are you with me so far? Question number two. Verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who will bring any charge, any accusation <clears throat> against whom God has chosen? Can you read in Malayalam? Can somebody read in Malayalam, please? Whom God has chosen, who will bring a charge against them? What is the answer? It is God who justifies. If God is justified, no man has the right to bring an accusation against the child of God. Are you with me? You see, therefore, I want you to listen to this carefully. You and I, we don't have a right to look at another child of God or a man of God and accuse them, saying that they are sinners or they're living in sin, or whatever. You and I, we don't have a right. Because God knows the relationship that they have with God. If God has justified them, if God has declared them righteous, we don't have a right to accuse them. Amen? So, I want you to know tonight that every one of us here sitting here, we have been justified by God. God is the one who has declared us righteous, not man. If God has declared as righteous, neither man nor the devil can bring any, any accusation against him. Amen? Because we don't stand with our righteousness. We stand clothed in the righteousness of God. And God is the one who declares us righteous. Are you with me? Amen? So question number two, Paul is saying, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? The answer is, it is God who justifies. So no one has a right to bring any charge or any accusation against the child of God because we stand clothed in the righteousness of God. Look at the security. Look at the deep assurance that a child of God has. And we need to walk in this assurance and then this security, that I'm a child of God, I've been justified by God. You know, no accusation will stand against me because God is my defender. Number three, verse 34. Who is he that condemns? Who is he that condemns? Can you read in Malayana? Verse 34. Shiksha Vidikinavan R. Who shiksha vidikinavan ad? Who is he that condemns a child of God? What is the answer? The answer Christ. is Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. That's the answer. Four things. That verse tells us four things. Jesus Christ died. He rose again. He's seated at the right hand of God. That's the position that he's occupying. And what is the work that he's doing? He's constantly interceding for you and for me. That means we have a God who's alive. He died. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of God. 
and is constantly interceding for you and for me on your behalf and my behalf. Every time we falter, every time we fall from the grace of God, we have our advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, constantly interceding on our behalf with God the Father, saying that, no, they are my children. I've loved them. I've redeemed them. I've forgiven them. I've clothed them with my righteousness. He's constantly interceding on your behalf and my behalf, day and night. Amen? So who can condemn us? No one can condemn us. But why? Because our advocate is constantly interceding for us in heaven. Amen. Are you with me? So can we do a quick recap? Question number one. What is question number one? Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? What is the answer? The answer is simple. If God has given his own son for us, how much more will he graciously not give us all things? He will give us grace. He will give us forgiveness. Everything that we needed. Number two, who will bring any charge against us? No one. Because God is the one who has justified us, not man. God is the one who said, you are righteous. Question number three. Who, who is he that condemns us? Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose again from the dead, seated at the right hand of God. He's constantly sitting for you and for me. So nobody can bring, nobody can condemn us at any time because Jesus, our elder brother, our advocate, is constantly interested. <laughs> Our elder brother, our advocate Jesus, is day and night. Pakshavadan Chedo did you, Yaji Chon did you, intercede you with you. Amen. Question number four Who shall separate us? From the love of Christ. Okay. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is it our love for Christ or God's love for us? What is Paul talking about? God's love for us. Yes. So that who can separate us from God's love for us? Separate It is not our love for God. Our love for God will increase and decrease. And, you know, one day we are high on love for God. The other day we are, you know, so love. Low on love for God. That keeps waiting. Sometimes we even might stop loving God. But Paul is talking about God's love for you and for me. Who can separate us from the love that God has for you and for me? He says, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword Verse 37, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul says, look, nothing in the heavens, 
nor anything on the earth. No experiences, nothing can take us away from the love of God, God's love for us. That means God's, God's love chased you and me and found you and me. Amen. And nothing can take us away from the love that God has for his children. I want you to understand this. When God chose us, his plan was to take us to eternity, not to leave us halfway. And God is fighting 24 7 to keep you and me with him. It is not that I'm fighting to keep myself in the Lord, but God is fighting 24 7 with the host of darkness to preserve you and me so that you and I, we are not lost. That is this assurance that we have, you know, that we receive in the scriptures. You know, it is with this confidence that we live every single day of our life. I want you to know this. Don't have even an iota of doubt. Will you and I reach eternity? The answer is yes, 100%, because God is the one who called us, and God is the one who's taking you and me to eternity. We are, not, we are not moving with our own strength. God is the one who's fighting the battle for you and for me. God is the one who's constantly interceding for you and for me. He has given us the Holy Spirit to help you and me. Nothing can separate you and me from the love that he has loved us. Nothing in heaven, nothing on earth can take you and me away from God's love. He loved us so much that he wants to take us home to be with him in eternity and make us like him. That's the point of glorification. Amen. Hallelujah. How much should we be thankful to the love of God and to the plan that God has worked out for you and for me? So that we can be his very own. The one sin or the two sin or the hundred sins that you and I now do. The enemy will keep accusing us. But God is interceding for you and for me. He freely gives forgiveness when we reach out to him. Amen. And, it is, and his plan is to take us home to be with him in eternity. And it is for that purpose. He left his heavenly glory. Came down to this earth. Went to the cross. Gave his life rose again from the dead, redeemed you and me, forgave you and me, justified you and me, and he is interceding constantly for you and for me, so that you and I can be with him in eternity. Amen? That's the security of salvation that you and I have. May God bless us this evening time. Amen? If there are any questions, you know, I, I want to stop the study of Romans. Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 8 is a, is a doctrine, is a main doctrinal part. 9 onwards, 9 talks about Israel. And from 10 onwards, you know, 10, 11 onwards, it talks about practical Christianity. Like, how do we live our Christian life on this earth? The do's and the don'ts. The practical Christian life is possible only when we understand the doctrinal truths very clear. Are you with me? Uh, for example, do you remember the message that was preached last Sunday? The Pastor Matthew? Yes. Do we remember that? Yes. Yeah, he preached from Romans chapter. Yeah, Romans. Yeah, Romans chapter 30. Correct? Yeah. We talk about practical Christian life then. Yeah. Is it you know, submit to yeah. every submit to every governing authority? Right? Because we are the ones whom God has placed above us. Right? Now, how is it possible to submit to very difficult people whom God has placed above us? It could be at home, it could be in the church, it could be in the office, it could be in the civil society. How can we submit? Right? It is only when we understand the doctrinal truths 
Romans chapter 8, verses 28 says, God works out everything for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? He wants to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. When we understand this doctrinal truth, it is easy for us to apply it in our practical Christian life. So when we have a difficult superior above us, we certainly say that, Lord, I know that I'm submitting because I know that you're going to work this out for my good. Are you with me? So it is only when we understand the doctrines can we live our Christian life more effectively. Practical Christian life, we can live it more effectively only when we understand the foundational truths that are there as doctrines, right? Then, you know, living it out becomes much more easy. Amen.